Okay, I am re-recording a lecture I gave a while ago because that recording didn't have any sound. Okay, so it's been a couple weeks since I've looked at the material, so it's not going to be as smooth as the original presentation, but hopefully it's not too uh, messed up. Alright, so in the lecture prior to this lecture, uh, we talked about uh, processes. We defined what a process was. Okay, a process is just a program in execution. So any given program can have uh, multiple processes uh, representing different executions of the same program. And processes have state, like the data that's stored in registers and memory, uh, that evolves over time. All right, and a given operating system has many processes running that represent different tasks, different, different programs that are doing work. And generally, that's all they're really is on an operating system that you um, care about. A bunch of different processes that are trying to do some work. And the, the OS kernel just um, manages those processes. So most operating systems use a um, strategy called limited direct execution for processes. So this is where the process normally operates without any um, real knowledge that there are other processes running on the system. Each process thinks that it has full use of the CPU and memory. So that's what limited direct execution means. A process can use all the registers, all the user registers anyway. There are certain registers that are hidden from the user processes, but um, ignoring those, um, a process can use all the registers, it can use all of virtual memory without any knowledge or care about what other processes are running and um, you know whether the use of those registers and memory might interfere with those other processes. In fact there's no way for a process to interfere with another process if the operating system has been designed properly and that's one of the main goals of the operating system to isolate different processes so each can run on its own without bothering the others. So CPUs have hardware support for two different, at least two different modes, user mode and kernel mode. Actually, most processes, processors uh, support more than two modes with different levels of privileges. But generally, those two, those two modes, user and kernel mode, are like limited, uh, limited privileges and full privileges. And user processes run in user mode, and they can't run every type of instruction that's available, but uh, just those that. Um, have a uh, limited effect. So by by forcing a user processes to run in user mode, um, we, we we limit the execution of those processes. Whenever a user process needs to do something that might affect that uses a shared resource um, and requires privileged instructions to get that work done, the user process uses an interrupt to trigger a system call to have the OS do something on its behalf. And interrupts in general, including system calls and also hardware generated interrupts, are things that interrupt the current execution and cause the kernel to run to do something. We also talked about the timer interrupt, with this, which is a special type of interrupt generated by a special piece of hardware called the, t the programmable timer which um, can be set up by the kernel to interrupt whatever is running after a certain amount of time. And this is what the kernel uses to make sure that it eventually gets a chance to run and that no one process can take over the machine by running forever. And so far we've covered up to chapter 6 in the book. And for the next chapter, for the next lecture, um, y you should read chapter 7 through 9. Now, <laughs> I, I call, one of the things that's a little frustrating about this class and, and operating system programming in general is that not only do we have to work with the C programming language, which is kind of inconvenient uh, and low level, but we also have to understand the uh, particular processor architecture that we're working with, which is at an even lower level. And if we're working with XB6 or um, Linux or uh, any desktop operating system, we're going to have to work with the Intel x86 processor architecture, which is even more frustrating than a typical 
instruction set architecture because it's kind of messy. And it's messy not because it was poorly designed exactly, but because it's been popular for 40 years. And over those 40 years, um, things have been added that were necessary at that at a particular point in time, but at this point, may, point in time may not really be necessary or the best way of doing things. So there's a lot of um, history that is included in the uh, Intel x86 instruction set architecture, and they can't really get rid of those old instructions and old features because that would break a lot of um, software that is still important and um, still in use. So in some sense, the popularity of the Intel x86 uh, processor has caused it to be um, messy because it requires backward compatibility. So in many cases, we're going to gloss over some of the low-level low details of the um, how the CPU handles things. And in those cases, uh, you can read the XV6 book and look at the code if you really need to know what's going on. And you can also sometimes look at the Linux source code if you want another view of how something is done at a low level. Okay. So interrupt handling um, is something that involves both the hardware and software, which is kind of interesting. So remember an interrupt is just something that um, interrupts the current execution and causes kernel code to run in a certain location to handle that specific interrupt. And the first, uh, the sequence of events to handle interrupt start with the CPU, because the CPU um, is, is what sees the interrupt, obviously, in, in hardware. And the first thing that the CPU hardware does is that it saves the main registers to the kernel stack. So the CPU knows that something else is going to have to run, so it has to do a context switch, essentially, to um, save the current state so that can, that state can be resumed later. So it copies the main registers to the kernel stack, because actually each process has two stacks, a user stack that's used for like the C function calls within that process. And then when, whenever the kernel runs on behalf of that process, it also has, um, it also makes function calls. So it has a stack for, um, for kernel mode as well. Okay. And the CPU sw switches, the, switches itself to kernel mode and it jumps to the appropriate interrupt handler code um, to handle the interrupt. So that's all handled by the hardware. The circuitry does that, or really the, the microprogramming within the CPU does that. And at that point, the kernel software takes over and can do whatever it needs to. So um, the kernel software will, depending on the interrupt, you know, it could do different things. But um, whenever it's done, there's a uh, special instruction it calls interrupt return IRET, which reverses the um, reverses the uh, switches back to user mode and allows the uh, user code to run again. And what I'm showing you here is the context switch code in XV6 and the context switch remember is just when we switch from one process to another and in order for that to happen, uh, certain registers from the old process need to be saved for later use, and then the saved registers for the new process that's going to be run need to be copied into the CPU so that it can resume in a way that, you know, in the exact same state where it left off, right? So in XV6, there's a struct context which stores just um, five integers, which are the values of five registers. Uh, in the CPU, and those those are saved for the process. Every process has these uh, registers saved when it's not running, and whenever that process is going to be run again, all five of these values need to be copied into these app these appropriate registers. And the code on the right hand side is just the code that essentially takes the current cop the, the current values of these registers and copies it into the uh, memory location where it's stored for that process. And it takes the stored values from the a new process that's going to be run and copies those into memory. Um, yeah, that's that's all that's happening here. Okay. Now we, I mentioned briefly that 
in last lecture that each process has its own virtual memory. And virtual memory is actually or organized in most, uh, most operating systems in such a way that um, different parts of the virtual memory are used for different purposes. Okay, so this diagram shows an example. And uh, this is an example of a, an operating system a little bit more sophisticated than XV6 because there, you know, it has things like shared libraries that don't exist in XV6. But in this particular example, we have the top of the memory range reserved for the kernel. So this, this picture here shows memory going from addre address zero at the bottom all the way up to whatever the topmost um, memory location. In this case, I think we're talking about a 32-bit address space, so it'd be you know, four, four gigabytes of memory. So if kernel virtual, virtual memory is up here, then we have to make sure that user processes cannot access this range of memory. We'll, we'll talk about how to do that later on in later, later lectures when we talk about uh, page tables and so forth. But below that, we have uh, the user stack, which grows downward from high addresses to low addresses. And the stack is something that is kind of like a feature built into the CPU to support uh, C-style function calls. And um, it grows downward as you are deeper in um, function calls. And then we also have a region dedicated to dynamically allocated memory, which we ca usually call the heap or the runtime heap. And for example, when you use the malloc command to uh, dynamically allocate memory, internally the, li the um, libc library might use the sbreak or mmap command to find a region of memory. In this case, um, this picture kind of shows using the sbreak command to increase the, uh, the memory boundary for that user process upward to make more space available, and then the malloc library manages that memory to, to, uh, to uh, provide uh, blocks of memory to the user, uh, to the user code. And in this particular case, the low memory range is not used because it's reserved for I.O. We'll talk later in the, in the class a little bit about how memory mapped I.O. actually reading and writing to memory sometimes results in an uh, instruction being sent to an external device. Okay. So that was just one example, what I showed you on the left. Um, that was kind of the something like the Linux process memory layout. But in XV6, the layout's a little bit different. So for example, in XV6, we still have kernel, uh, the kernel using the high part of virtual memory. But the ordering, the position of the stack in the heap is different compared to Linux. Like in XV6, the user stack is actually limited to just one page long, so one, which means uh, four kilobytes. And it resides right above the code of the of the process. So I forgot to mention that before, but you know, the inexecutable file has instructions to, to run the program and that has to be loaded into memory. That's shown um, down here. And um, there's also uh, global variables that are defined at compile time, uh, which can be loaded when you load the executable file. Both in Linux and in XV6, that um, that data is, is near the bottom of the virtual memory space, but then directly above it in XP6 you have the stack, whereas in Linux you have a heap, and you have a heap above that in XP6. Whereas generally in Linux you'd have a gap, and then you have um, somewhere further up you'd have a stack at the top of the address space that grows downward. And the, the one of the flaws of this XP6 design, it's simpler, but the stack, because it grows downward, it doesn't have space to expand beyond the one page that was initially allocated for it. And that, that's the reason why Linux puts it near the top, is to give it space to expand downward. Okay, so I mean, the, the reason I'm showing you this is as an example of how operating systems vary in their details. And so um, it can be hard to know the first time you're looking at, at an operating system, whether you're seeing something that is...
universal to every operating system and every processor architecture, or if it's something just specific to those that particular pair of operating system and processor architecture that you're looking at. Um, so instruction sets vary depending on the type of processor that you're using. So I'm showing pictures here of uh, a smartphone, a laptop, and a, a big server. And in each one of those three machines could use a very different type of processor that has a different instruction set. And you know whether it's an ARM, PowerPC, Spark, uh, Intel x86, uh, AMD x86. Uh, so the low-level details of the code for those different types of machines will be different. And xv6 only supports one of those. It'll only run on a PC-compatible um, Intel CPU uh, machine. But uh, other operating systems, like Linux in particular, is kind of um, unique in that it supports like 30 different processor architectures. And it does that by very cleverly isolating uh, low-level code from uh, gen the generic reusable code. So in order to you know, do, do the work for this class and to understand what's going on, we're going to have to look at some low-level code. But um, sometimes that low-level code we're looking at is not fundamentally important because it, it, it'll be different depending on what type of machine we're talking about. So um, I'm going to try not to get hung up on the details of that machine-dependent code. Just as a quick aside, I wanted to mention, uh, talk about, remind you what timers do, because I mentioned it in the last class. Um, you know, the programmable timer, programmable interrupt timer on a PC is a piece of hardware that's available to the, uh, for the kernel to program to interrupt itself after a while. And this allows the, the kernel to schedule a process and to be confident that the process will only run for a limited amount of time because eventually the timer interrupt will uh, kick off and that'll let the, the kernel run again and to decide maybe to run a different process, right? In embedded systems, there's a similar idea called a watchdog timer, which has a different function, but it's actually a pretty similar function. A watchdog timer, uh, what it does is it's a countdown. It's a device that you can program to reboot the machine after a certain amount of time. And this is very useful in embedded systems that are critical. For example, the Mars rover that I'm showing a picture of here is a, a system that's deployed to another planet. and um, it's got code that probably has bugs. Actually, we, we saw that it did have bugs. Um, and but you can't you can't go up there and restart the thing manually because uh, there's no one there to do it. And you can't ha you can't restart it through software if the software itself is what's buggy. So um, the watchdog timer is something that helps you deal with that. So what it does is, like I said, it period it reboots the machine after a certain amount of time. So you can say you can set it up to say okay in 30 seconds reboot the machine, and of course the goal is to not reboot the machine but to uh, detect when the software or hardware is hung up, and at that point let the watchdog timer reboot the machine. But otherwise, um, your your software should periodically reset that timer. So as long as everything is working normally, then you should be able to, um, you sh your code should run before the watchdog timer expires and you should be able to reset the timer to to bring, bring it back to, let's say if you're rebooting every 30 seconds, you can bring it back to 30 seconds before 30 seconds runs out. Um, but if not, if there's a, a big, big problem where something is stuck in an infinite loop, then actually the timer will expire. It's a device that's outside the CPU so um, if there's a malfunction in the CPU, it won't, won't be affected, won't affect the watchdog timer, and the timer can actually reboot the machine. And hopefully that reboot is enough to return it to normal operation eventually. But, you know, it's pretty similar to the idea of a um, programmable interrupt timer in an OS. All right, so the next topic I'm going to talk about here is process creation in Unix. And it's kind of, um, it's a little bit strange. It uses a combination of two system calls, fork and exec, which behave in kind of weird ways. So when, you, you might imagine you, just, you would have a system call called um, create process, 
which maybe takes as a parameter a file name or a list of instructions that define what the code is for that process. Like in other words, like here's a program, create a process for it. But that's not really what happens in Unix. Instead, we have fork and exec. So what fork does is it creates an exact duplicate of the current process, except it's it's not it isn't it, it, we want it to be a new process so we give it a new process id and um, we ha we keep track of the parent and child of processes so the the new process will, will be marked as a child of whoever called fork and it'll actually be executing the exact same point of the code where the parent process called fork which is kind of weird we'll come to that but the return code, the return value of that fork command that triggered the duplication of the processes, it'll be different in the parent and child, and that allows you to um, write code that does does work in in um, multiple processes a little bit easier. And I think you'll see what I mean with some examples I'm going to show. The second part of process creation is this exec command, which basically takes if it's if you call exec, it loads the code out of a file and it overwrites that code in the current process. So basically it, 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 it runs a program in the current process. So in order to start a new process, you have to both fork and exec. You have to fork in order to create a new process in, this, in the system and exec to make the identity of that process equal to uh, the code that's in some file. Um, and you might imagine that, you know, the, the simpler uh, design would have been to combine those two things to a, a single process create uh, command, but actually separating them out makes uh, certain things easier, like the uh, command line shell implementation is a lot easier if you have a separate fork and exec, because then you can actually do something between fork and exec. Um, for example, you can set up standard input and standard output according to the um, uh, p pipes that were set up by the um, command line. So although, let's look at fork in action. So here's a simple program that, oops, a simple program that prints hello world and it prints the current process ID and then it forks and fork uh, has a return value. Um, so what fork does is, just, is it, um, you know, when, when fork is called, you'll end up with two processes that are both running at this exact point that, that are pointed to by the arrow. The new process doesn't start from the beginning. That's one of the, um, that's an important uh, point. And this fork function will return different values for the two copies. So in the child process, it'll return zero. So this RC will be zero in the child. But in the parent RC, the return code will be the uh, process ID of the child that was created. So um, everything else about the processes will be the same. For example, they have the same standard input, standard output, standard error. Like the same files will be open. But the yeah, whatever is returned by the fork function will be different. And it'll be executing at the same point. And it's not, it also is not clear which one will be running first. That's up to the scheduler of the operating system. But they both will be runnable. So in this particular code, uh, when fork is called, you now have two processes running here. And this if, uh, this the condition in, in this if will be um, actually, it also returns minus one if fork failed, and that would happen if, for example, you've reached the maximum number of processes that can exist in the system. But assuming that that doesn't happen, you have these two other possibilities down here. Either the return code is zero, meaning that you're executing the child. Uh, in this case, I just print out hello on the child and it prints out the process ID. Or um, if it's not equal to zero and it's not less than zero, it's greater than zero, then RC, the value of RC, is actually the uh, process ID of the child and that's available to the parent. So in this case, I just I print out hello, I am the parent of, of um, 
the child ID, and then um, in parentheses I have the parent IDs, the parent process ID. So overall the output will be these three lines printed out by two different processes to the same standard output. So this hello world line is printed out by the original process. You can see that ID 29146. And then these other two lines are printed by two different processes. One of them is printed by the original parent, 29146. The, set, the last one is printed out by the child, 29147. Um, and the parent actually knows the ID of the child because that's what was returned by fork. Right? Now one interesting thing about this very simple code is that it has uh, what's called non-determinism, meaning that it can actually output two different things and we don't really know which one it's going to print out. Now the th two things it's going to print out or can print out are not totally different, but basically after fork is called in the third line here, the system has two processes and the OS can schedule either one of them to run at any time and it can switch between them whenever it wants to. Like the user process has no control over when it's scheduled really and it has no visibility uh, doesn't know when it's going to be scheduled, scheduled again. Um, yeah. So it's possible that after fork is called that the child will run first or that the parent will run first. And you know, possibility one shows the parent running first and that's why you see hello I'm the parent. And then you see hello I'm the child after the parent finishes, the child process runs. But in the second possibility, um, the we have the child running first and then the parent. You can print two different things. Okay. And we can't predict which one it's going to do. It depends on the runtime situation, and particularly it depends on the decision that the uh, scheduler makes. So if we don't know what the program's output's going to be, or, I mean, more, more precisely, if, if running a program different times with the same inputs produces different outputs, we say that program is non-deterministic or indeterminate. Um, and non-determinism or indeterminate code arises uh, in concurrent programs when there's a race condition. This is an important topic we're going to come back to later. A race condition uh, means that you have two things that are happening at the same time, right? Like in this example, we had a child and a pro parent process that are both running and both printing kind of at the same time. It's not clear which is going to finish first, and the output will be different depending on which finishes first. Those are the general conditions for a race condition, the, the requirements for a race condition. And so in the fork example, the two competing tasks were the parent process waiting to run and print, the child process waiting to run and print. Um, and, you know, either one could, whichever one won the race, you know, if, if you have a different winner, you have different outputs. And race conditions can lead to very difficult software bugs, um, which is why I'm bringing it up here. Because uh, you might have a situation where, you know, 99% of the time the program behaves one way and it looks like it's correct. But then sometimes if the timing is a little bit different, uh, like if for some reason the race is won by, uh, by a different path in the code, your program behaves differently. And all of a sudden you have, um, you have a bug, you have incorrect behavior. And it can be very difficult to figure, to test it because you can try, while you're testing it, you may actually not see the problem. And so and Heisenbugs, are uh, you know named after the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics, where if you observe something, it um, changes its state. That's a Heisenbugs refers to bugs that you know if that disappear when you're testing them, uh, and usually the reason that they disappear is because while testing you can um, interfere with the timing of the system, right? Here's a case where we have non-determinism and a, a bug. Um, due to non-determinism. And you, you may write code like this. This code may, may work most of the time, but then once in a while, it may crash. And that would be really frustrating because you may th you, you wrote your code and you, you tested it and it seems like it's working. And then later on you get an error and you have no idea why. 
and you may have even forgotten that you wrote this code and you may think that the error came from some new code but actually the came the code came the error came from old code that you had thought was working so in this particular uh, code what it does is it opens a file and it calls <clears throat> it calls fork to create a child and at that point we, the child does one thing and the parent does another depending on you know the process ID that was returned by the fork we can, we can distinguish between whether a current process is the child or the parent so the child uh, reads from this file that was opened and it prints something out uh, prints out the character that was read from the file the parent also reads from the file and then it does something does some, calls this do some work function that takes a long time and then when it's finished it closes the file and then um, they both exit. So most of the time this will work just fine. But there's a scenario where this will crash very rarely. And um, that's because there's a race condition between the, the, the child's read and the parent's close. So the child's read here and this close down here. So most of the time the read will happen first. If we assume that do some work is a, is a long function, like some function that takes a long time, because um, because if, even if the parent is scheduled to run before the child after the fork uh, if it spends a lot of time in the, in the do some work function eventually the scheduler will decide to give the child a chance to run and then the child will be able to do its read but if if this do some work is fast unexpectedly and the parent is scheduled first what could happen is the parent reads prints do calls do some work and then the parent closes the file before the child has even run so then when the child runs it calls a read on this file descriptor which is shared um, and it will uh, it will crash because uh, the file is already closed Okay, so here I have a listing of some Unix system calls. We talked so far, I think the exa example we used were kill and read, maybe open, but there, there are many other system calls, even in XV6, which is a pretty simple operating system. So here are some process-related system calls, and you know these are all things that the that user code um, ha has to ask the operating system these are all things that the uh, user code uses to ask the operating system to do something on its behalf. So uh, the first exit asks the operating system to terminate the current process. So you, you call exit generally at the end of every program. Fork, as we saw, duplicates the current process. Wait is used to wait for a process to terminate. If you pass in the process ID of that other process, exec runs a program in the current process like we saw it kind of takes the code we didn't really see in detail yet but um, it loads code from a file and it, it runs that code there are functions to get the current time um, brk break asks for more memory basically um, I said earlier on that each process has virtual memory that makes it seem like it has the full uh, memory address space to use but in reality um, that's not really true it does it does have the the whole address space is kind of reserved for it but it has it can't use memory until it asks the OS for permission to use it and that allows the OS to uh, manage me memory mappings so initially a process may only have a small amount of memory, memory to use but then the break command changes the, the um, endpoint of that memory either increases or decreases it get PID gets the current process ID uh, pause which for signal from another process and kill sends a signal from another process so these two kind of go together and you can uh, get the user ID of the current process or set the user ID so th these don't these are not present in um, xv6 because xv6 doesn't have users but in most Unix operating systems you have the idea of the notion of different user IDs um, 
and every process is run by a certain user. Okay, we also have a bunch of file related system calls like read and write, open, close, change directory, make node creates a file system folder, um, uh, chmod changes the permissions of a file, uh, chchone changes the ownership of a file, and then if you have a file open, seek changes like the cursor position within, within the file where you're reading or writing, utime changes the modification time of a file, and uh, mount and unmount mount or unmount file system. So this is for um, essentially opening a disk, the contents of a disk. So to uh, review how system calls work, I'm showing here some a simple C uh, function, a simple C code that does two things. It calls write to print something out prints hello world and it calls exit to indicate that it's done. So this is kind of like printf this first uh, write except uh, printf is actually a libc function a user level library so when you use printf uh, the compiler uh, links to a, a library function that in, inside of printf it uses write or other appropriate system calls to do what it needs to do and one, in this case, the, the, pr the first parameter, one, uh, to write, is actually uh, refers to standard output. This is a, a constant that refers to the standard out file. And hello world is the, the string we're printing, and that's 13 characters long. So if you look at the implement, when you compile this, the code you get looks something like this. Um, there's a There's, some, there's a constant defined up here for the hello world string but the important thing down here in the implementation of main you see that there are two system calls both of these uh, lines are system calls there's a write system call and there's an exit system call okay so to, to call the write system call what happens is um, we move the system call number which happens to be four into the EAX register, we move the first parameter into EBX, the second parameter, which is a pointer to this uh, string uh, constant, into ECX, and uh, we copy the third parameter, which is the length of the string, into edx register. So I think this is using the Linux. Uh, this is using the Linux system call um, scheme. And in Linux, actually, system calls have parameters passed in different registers. Whereas in XP6, you use the user stack to pass parameters. So this is actually different in XP6 and Linux. But once you set it up, you call use the interrupt instruction with the parameter 80, which in, in Linux, or not 80, but this is, um, uh, I think this is, one, this is 128, it's hex 80. That in Linux is the, um, indicates a system call. That, that's the, the number for, for system call interrupts as opposed to, you know, hardware interrupts. And then similarly for the exit uh, function invocation here, it's actually simpler because there's only one parameter, but in this case, the system call number for um, for exit is one. This says zero, it should be one. So you copy one into the EAX register, and the argument is zero. So you copy that into EBX register, and you call um, the int instruction with the same number uh, eight zero as uh, the parameter. And so in both these cases, most of the work is being handled by the kernel. All the user co uh, code has to do is uh, make two system calls. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, exceptions in kernel code. So exceptions happen when um, the CPU encounters a condition that it doesn't know what to do with. Um, for example, divide by zero, 
or um, a page fault, which we haven't talked about yet. But if it's trying, if you're trying to access an invalid memory address, the CPU won't know what to do, and so it, it raises an exception, which is a special type of interrupt, and um, that's handled like all interrupts. Exceptions are handled by the kernel, but if an exception happens in the kernel. Um, there could be a problem, especially if there's an exception in an interrupt handler in the kernel. So if at some point the OS just doesn't know what to do because it it's um, it, it gets an exception in an exception handling code, the the kernel just has to give up. Um, and that in Linux and XV6 that's called a kernel panic, and you'll see this when you're developing your projects. In Windows, uh, the blue screen of death is. Uh, their way of uh, doing a kernel panic and, sh and showing that the kernel has crashed, doesn't know what to do, some unexpected condition has occurred. Um, so kernel developers see this, but hopefully users sh should not, because uh, like you know, most problems in um, the point of the operating system is to uh, like gracefully kill code that does something wrong and let something else run. But if the kernel itself has a problem, then that's what causes the panic, and there's nothing it can do. Um, so in Windows, it might look like this. On the left is the old version. On the right is the new version. And basically, it just asks you to restart your computer. And on Mac, uh, there's something similar. On Linux, there's something similar, but less pretty. It just says kernel panic. Um, and it also prints out some debug information about like the call stack at the time of the panic. All right. So one of the interesting things about Linux is that it supports like 30, uh, 31 CPU architectures and, and more you know, every year, it seems. And the way it does this is by having different low-level code for different builds. So when you build the kernel, you don't just build it generically, but you have to, t you have to configure which um, processor you're building it for and also which modules you want to include and various other parameters. But um, so the code base includes some C and assembly code at a low level that, that works at a low level, and it's actually different depending on what uh, architecture you're compiling it for. And it also includes includes higher level code that is the same regardless of what machine you're compiling for. And these like so different ports of the Linux operating system. We use a port to refer to a uh, variation that's designed for a different machine architecture, different ports are managed by different groups. So for example, a lot of the uh, ARM source code has uh, comments like the following showing that you know people working at ARM developed that part of the Linux code in order to um, support the hardware that they're developing. And so when you're dividing, writing an OS for multiple CPU architectures, you have some things that are the same, some things that are different. So things that are different are, you know, all the assembly code generally has to be different, and some of the C code that works at a low level. So the boot code has to be different. Um, mechanisms for interrupt handling, context switching, memory management, all those things that require you to like read the CPU uh, architecture manual. And device drivers generally have to be different because the way you do I/O tends to be different on different CPU architectures. Now what's the same includes the high level code, so this is like most of the C code that handles like file system implementations, process scheduling, inter-process communication, networking, security and user management, and all the policies for context switching and memory management. So um, XB6 is a simple operating system, so in that, for XB6 there might be like half the code is kind of low level and specific to, to the x86 processor, but in Linux because it's a more sophisticated OS, it has a more high-level code that is generic. So in that case, maybe there's a, le a smaller fraction that is um, specific to any particular uh, processor architecture. Although it supports many architectures, so therefore, if you look at the code base as a whole, there's a lot of code dedicated to low-level stuff. It's just that for any given build, only a small amount of the code being used for that build is um, low-level uh, machine-specific. So here's an example in Linux of a single function or a single file that is defined in two different ways 
depending on what CPU architecture you're working with. So this is the code for a context switch. Uh, and it's in a file called entry.s. On the left, I'm showing the code for, excuse me, on the left, I'm showing the code for x86. And you see here, it does um, pushes and pops to uh, save uh, to save registers to the stack. But in, um, in the ARM architecture, instead it does, um, it uses instructions, I believe, that, that store things directly in memory. Like it has it loads and store instructions that copy things from registers to memory. Um, so anyway, so like the, the, the particular assembly instructions on ARM are different than the instructions available in x86. And also the general um, style of assembly programming is different on ARM than it is on x86. So even though these two things are doing the same thing functionally, the way they work is, um, is different. And if you're compiling an x86 Linux kernel, you'll use the code on the left and the code on the right will be ignored and vice versa. And then to look along another dimension, you can take the same functionality. So that same context switch in Linux on the left is what I was showing you before. A context switch is something that also exists, exists in X, XV6, a different operating system. And I'm showing code for the same CPU architecture. These are both x86, but um, it's a different, different operating system. And the, so the code ends up being mostly the same, but also somewhat different because some of the, um, you have some flexibility about how to implement this depending on, um, you know, you can choose your own conventions sometimes. So for example, um, the code on the left in Linux for context switch, it takes as a um, param it assumes that you have preset the values of two registers, EAX and EDX, to point to the previous task struct and the next task, task struct. Whereas the code for XV6 assumes that those two things are passed on the, st on the stack. And then also another difference is that the ordering of these two things, of the registers and the structures are different. Like uh, on Linux, it goes uh, EBP, EBX, EDI, ESI, but then on x 6 it's EBP, EBX, ESI, EDI. So these two registers are reordered. And it, it doesn't matter as long, this order is just a convention that's used by the operating system. As long as it's consistent within the operating system, it doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, I hope that was helpful.